Welcome back to my video series on complex variables. Today's video is going to go over Cauchy's theorem, which is one of the most important results in complex calculus. But before we do that, I'm going to briefly go over complex integrals. Here's how it works. Suppose I have a complex function f of z, and I want to integrate that in the complex plane from a complex number a to another complex number b. For a real function like f of x, Integrating from a to b would be very simple, because when going from a to b, you just have to traverse along a straight interval. For complex functions, though, instead of having a straightforward path along an interval, you could go along multiple paths from a to b when performing your integration. Each of these paths could give you different results for the integral. So in that sense, complex integration is a lot like line integration in that a path has to be defined for the integration. This is all because complex numbers can be thought of as two-dimensional numbers, in that they exist on an entire plane instead of just a straight line. Because complex integration is a lot like line integration, the method of solving complex integration problems is very similar to that for line integration. Suppose I want to integrate from a to b along a path c an arbitrary complex function f of z, which is composed of a real part u and an imaginary part v. Suppose also that my curve C can be expressed in terms of the parametric equations, in which x and y are both functions of some parameter t, which varies from alpha to beta as we traverse the curve. Hopefully you're familiar with parametric equations and how they work. The integral of f of z dz along the curve C can be simplified by decomposing f into its real and imaginary parts and doing the same thing for the differential dz. We can expand out the part inside the integral to get the integral along c of u dx minus the integral along c of v dy plus the imaginary number times the integral along c of v dx plus the integral along c of u dy. We can now make a change of variables by writing the differential dx as the product of dx by dt times dt and doing the same for the differential dy. Since the integration variable has now changed to t, we need to change the limits of integration accordingly. In this case, the limits of integration all become alpha and beta, because that's what t varies along. It varies from alpha to beta on the curve c. And we're done. This is the formula for evaluating a complex integral given a complex function f of z and a parametrized path c. So if you're given the function f of z to integrate, you can find its real and imaginary parts u and v. Then you can find the parametric equation of the given curve C, and then you can evaluate the integral using this formula. But there's much more to complex integrals than just the simple integration process, and this is where we transition to the real meat of the lecture, which is Cauchy's theorem. Cauchy's theorem describes complex integrals. Specifically, it's a theorem about the integral of complex functions f of z around a closed curve, also known as contour integrals. By closed curve, I just mean a curve that encloses a finite area. Specifically, Cauchy's theorem states that if I have a complex function f of z and a closed curve c which satisfy the following three conditions, one is that f is holomorphic or differentiable on and everywhere inside c, the second is that c is a simple curve, by which I mean it doesn't cross itself, and the third is that c has a finite number of corners, so a square is fine but something crazy like a Weierstrass function isn't. If all these three conditions are satisfied, then the contour integral around c of f of z dz is a big fat zero. To summarize, if f is holomorphic, then its contour integral along a nice enough closed curve will be zero. Now, unlike the little cop-out that I did last time, I'm actually going to man up today and prove this theorem for you. The proof is actually pretty simple, but in this simple proof I'm going to impose an additional condition, that df dz is also continuous. Now you might say that isn't a holomorphic complex function supposed to have continuous derivatives? In fact, isn't it supposed to have derivatives of all orders if you remember the previous lecture? Well, it is, but those facts need to be proven because they came in the form of a theorem. And for that theorem to be proven, you actually require Cauchy's theorem, which we're proving right here, you actually require Cauchy's theorem to be true. So starting out Cauchy's theorem by saying, oh, if f of z has a derivative, then that derivative must be continuous, would be circular logic. That's why we've written df dz is continuous as an assumption instead of a fact which follows from f being holomorphic. It's also possible to prove this theorem without making that assumption, but it's much more difficult if you want to do that. 
Anyway, let's begin. As usual, we can write a complex function f of z as a composition of its real part u and its imaginary part v. We can also write the differential dz as a composition of its real part dx and its imaginary part dy. If we put these together in our integral of f of z, then we can expand out our expression to end up with the closed integral along c of u dx minus v dy plus i times the closed integral along c of v dx plus u dy. And this is where we use a result from your glory days in vector calculus. That result is called Green's theorem, which says that the line integral along a simple closed curve of p dx and q dy equals the double integral over the region enclosed by the curve of dq dx minus dp dy, provided p and q are continuous and have continuous derivatives. In terms of two-dimensional vector fields, it just means that the line integral of a vector field on a closed loop equals the double integral of the curl of that vector field over the area enclosed by that loop. We can apply Green's theorem to both the first and second integrals in this expression. Start with the first one. We compare it to the p and q in Green's theorem, then we can see that u here is like p, and negative v here is like q. So when we apply Green's theorem, we get the double integral of, over the area enclosed by c of negative dv dx minus du dy. Now recall that if a function f of z is holomorphic, then its real and imaginary parts obey the cauchy raymond relations. It then follows that the function we're using in the proof of Cauchy's theorem also obeys the cauchy raymond relations because after all it's holomorphic, according to one of the initial assumptions, the statement. Since the cauchy raymond relations apply, du dy equals negative dv dx. Since these two partial derivatives are being subtracted in the integrand of i1, it follows that this integrand becomes zero, which means that this integral i1 as a whole becomes zero. We can use the same argument on the integral i2. When we apply Green's theorem on this integral, it, it just becomes the double integral over the area enclosed by c of du dx minus dv dy. Again, since the cauchy raymond relations hold true, the integrand just cancels out and it follows that i2 is also zero. Since i1 is zero and i2 is zero, i1 plus i2 is zero. And it follows that the closed integral along c of f of z dz is zero plus zero i, which is just zero. And this proves Cauchy's theorem. It should be noted that it's also possible to prove Cauchy's theorem without assuming the function f has a continuous derivative. I mentioned this earlier as well. But in that case, the proof is more lengthy, and it doesn't really add much to our understanding, so I left that part out. Anyway, that should be it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to move on to proving a formula related to contour integrals.